Welcome to Progress in San Diego. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. My name is Walter Davis. I have the honor this evening to be interviewing Mr. Chuck Ambers of the African Museum, which is called Casa del Rey Moro. Mr. Ambers, tell me, why is the African Museum called Casa del Rey Moro? Because of the African-Spanish influence that came into the Western Hemisphere with the Spaniards that many people don't know about, that uh, Africans, a uh, mixture of Africans and Islamic people uh, from North Africa control all of Spain, all of Portugal, parts of France, Germany, and Italy for close to 800 years. About two-thirds of those individuals were indigenous black Africans of Islamic faith, and they left a bloodline that changed the history of the world. A lot of people simply are not aware of that history. I think that that was described in a lot of history books as the Dark Ages. Is that not correct? Or? Well, you have some of that coming in from 711 up until the spring of 1492. Mm -hmm. As I said, all of Spain, all of Portugal, parts of France, Germany, and Italy. And with some of the graphics that we have and books that we have, we can show you some of that history because very seldom do I ever say anything without bringing an arsenal of books, videos, historical documentation from around the world. Okay, so talk about that. Do you have some of your arsenal here? Let us talk about this book here and the okay. knife. That is Stanley Lane Poole's book called The uh, Moors in Spain. The knife is authentic and we have a graphic of what the symbol of the, uh, the museum is. This is the Casa del Remoro. This is the Grand Palace of Alhambra in Granada, Spain where the Moors controlled Spain for over 700 years. And that's the Moorish king. That's the Moorish king, and this graphic was painted 130 years ago by an Austrian artist, Edward Chalamont. It's been in Europe for 130 years. Uh, it's the centerpiece of the museum. We sell them quite a bit between this graphic, the book, and the knife is one of the real reasons that I'm in Old Town with the first Europeans that landed with uh, Juan Cabrillo, you have people of African descent, descendants of these gentlemen, and they've been there all the time. So that's why I'm in Old Town, the historical district with the first Europeans and not in the so-called African-American community because with the first Europeans that landed in Old Town, and we've been there since, ever since. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, this book was written in the 1800s, was it not? 1886 by uh, a British scholar, Stanley Lane Poole. The graphic was painted in 1878 by an Austrian artist, Edward Chalamont. So with this graphic in that book, you have two separate Europeans from two different countries speaking two different languages, trying to enlight, uh, enlighten the world that 65, 70% of the Moors were indigenous black Africans, and they, they left a bloodline that has changed the history of the world. And they Simply. did some very amazing discoveries, right, in, in, uh, in terms of disinfectants. Uh, you look at the science of engineering and architecture, you talk about Spanish architecture, you're really talking about Moorish math and the, and the ovals and the archways that you see, much of what we see here in the San Diego area and Southern California as uh, Spanish architecture is really Moorish math. You talk about the language being impacted by uh, African languages. You're talking about dance, you're talking about foods, a little of everything crossing the whole society of the conquist so-called conquistadors that came into the Western Hemisphere. Okay, now you said you had an arsenal. What else do you have in your arsenal here? And all of this can be obtained at the African Museum, correct? Yes, we sell many of the books the artifacts, and I don't know where I need to go. I think I will start with this book here that called They Came Before Columbus by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, who talks to the Africans that sailed across the Atlantic as captains of their own ships 3,000 years ago. You have 18 stone heads. I've touched 16 of the 18, part of a doctorate program that your tax dollars helped to pay for, by the way, from Chula Vista Elementary School 30 years ago. And so between the books, the graphics, the research that we've done, and um, that is all a part of it. The research center at the museum, uh, everything that I try to identify is internationally cross-referenced through UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, home based in Paris, France. Since 19, about 1974, 140 some odd countries belong to UNESCO 
And that way you have an international multilingual element of academics where no one or two people speaking English or Dutch or so, but you have a total international world authenticating most of what I try to say at the museum. So what you're talking about here is a paradigm shift. We're talking about something that's not Eurocentric in concept, not centered around the, the European history as we've been taught it here uh, in the United States. He who wins the wars writes the books. His story. And quite often tells his story and not necessarily history. So this is just from a different perspective of the whole world getting a chance to tell their part of the history. So we have English, Dutch, French, Portuguese, Spanish, a little German, Swahili. Uh, we have uh, such a research center with uh, 6,000 books in nine languages, because if you only function in one language, you really can't study and teach the history of the world. And so that's why we have such a research center with 8,000 slides, and I do 26 different slide presentations. We have over 2,000 videos, DVDs, and they're all being transferred into uh, an electronic textbook where I can teach my four college classes out of the museum over the internet. And that's part of what the history is. So we go from uh, dealing with some of the uh, stone heads that can be traced here in the, in the Western Hemisphere 3,000 years. They sailed across the Atlantic and possibly boats made out of papyrus reeds. A European named by the name of Thor Heidedal did the sail afloat in 1969, and 13 months later, a second float in the, in the same boat made out of papyrus reeds that floated right across the Atlantic into the Caribbean to show how Africans could have done that, and very easily so. So I go back to the Olmec first, only because of the chronological history 3,000 years ago. So this defies the story of Amerigo Vespucci and Columbus. No, it just happened before Columbus. Okay? Exactly. And so we talk about what Columbus found. When Columbus landed in the Americas, uh, the Native Americans gave him spear tips that they had traded with Africans. Those spear tips were returned to, were, went to Spain on Columbus's first voyage, and they were f an analyzed, essayed, and found to be exactly 18 parts gold, 6 parts silver, and 8 parts copper the exact metallurgical mixture of the West African Guinea coin. Those spear tips are on display at uh, La, La Universi no, um, the Museum of the Americas in Madrid, Spain today, but you never hear about them. And so when you talk about that metallurgical science, you got to go to West Africa. And that's why this little guy is standing here, because this ad addresses 2,000 years of metallurgical science from ancient Nigeria, Ife Benin, that goes back. So we talk about Africans and their metallurgical science 2,000 years ago, and that's part of that mixture that you see in the Western Hemisphere that can't be explained if you remove the African. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I was saying is that most people that are immersed in the Eurocentric way of educating people are limited. Limited, yes. I'll say limited. And, and so I'll be kind and say limited. Okay. Very good. I was an educator for over 30 years in the mainstream public schools, uh, and now we teach teachers. We teach teachers in 10 states, 9 countries, and 3 languages. And we teach them about some of the first Africans that arrived, but we also teach about some of the first high level civilization in the history of the world. This is just one of about 75 photos of statues, carvings, and mummies. Mm -hmm. That is a statue of a pharaoh with dreadlocks. Hollywood has never shown you a statue of a pharaoh with braids. And that is only one of 74 photos in an exhibit that I deal with ancient Nile Valley civilization. So we put Africans back into Egypt, and we put Egypt back on the African continent because it's been there all the time. <laughs> okay? Simply and amazing. so this is just, we move from one uh, chronological timeline to the next mm -hmm. and somewhat of an order. Okay. So we talk about the first, ancient Kemet or Egypt. Mm -hmm. We come into how they sailed across the Atlantic as captains of their own ships. Mm -hmm. uh, we have remains, 18 stone heads. Mm -hmm. You have skulls and uh, braids and identification of some of that cultural history that's been there all the time. 
don't want to take anything away from any of the Native American civilization in the Western Hemisphere, but if you remove the African from the Olmec society, you deal with a quantum leap in technology that can't be explained. And we can talk about that, and that's what Dr. Ivan Van Sernemore has done uh, since 1976 when he did the book and all the concurrent uh, conferences and things that we've had in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me more about your arsenal. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? We want to talk about a little bit of how, what some of those conquistadors look like when they sailed across the ocean with Columbus and Cortez and Pizarro and Balboa and Ponce de Leon and right here in San Diego with Juan Cabrillo. Uh, every September the 28th, I put on a period attire outfit and I portray some of the African Spanish sailors that sailed into San Diego with Juan Cabrillo at Cabrillo National Monument at the Cabrillo Festival out in Point Loma. And so we talk about this gentleman, but we also have to talk about this gentleman because he was the Duke of Florence, Italy. And so we talk about some of that history and graphics that was not put into our institutionally racist textbooks. And so he's part of the Medici, the Medici family. And we have uh, thousands of pictures that I've traveled to 40 countries over 40 years, spending a half million dollars of your tax money, by the way. Thank you for your tax money. And these are the kind of graphics and books that we bring back to put it back into the textbook because they just simply have fallen out of the textbook. And that's a part of it. And so from there, you go into books that they deal with. Early Europe and some of that influence of Africans that control all of Southern Europe, so much so that Southern Europeans get a similar blood disease as sickle cell anemia because of all that African blood mixture. Some Southern Europeans call it Cooley's anemia, but it's a similar sickling of the blood cells. That's why most Southern Europeans are darker with curly hair, brown eyes, unlike Northern Europeans with uh, fair skin, blue eyes, uh, blonde hair, and you talk about the difference, and that's part of what that difference is, because they control uh, all of Southern Europe and left a, uh, not only a cultural, but a racial difference in Southern Europe. And so these are the kind of books that we have in various languages so that we don't take anything away from anyone, but you try to tell the whole truth, and it's been there all the time. Mm -hmm. This is all very fascinating. We have about 15 minutes. I want to sure. make sure that we, we cover everything. Uh, Most importantly, uh, because we're here in San Diego with the history of Spain, the history of Mexico, I also like to talk to all of that African history that came through Mexico. Because about 41% of Cortez's men were of mixed African descent could trace their ancestry back five or six generations on Spanish soil, and they came right into Mexico, up the West Coast, into California, into San Diego, and all of that history that you have, and books like this in Spanish. The book has never been translated into English. It's called La Población Negra de México, and it has yet to be translated into English. And so these are the kind of books that we don't have privilege to unless it's for our bilingual students and things like that. And so these are some of the history of, of elements like that that we talk about, books. Fascinating. The first free black city in the Western Hemisphere is not in Cuba, it's not in Haiti, it's in Mexico. And it's named after this gentleman. His name is Yanga. And going back to 1630, he had a city named after him. And every August the 5th in Mexico, you have a group of African Mexicans that celebrate the history of Yanga and his free city, which is halfway between Mexico City on the main freeway going down to Veracruz, the eastern seaport off the Caribbean, and halfway between Mexico City and Veracruz, you have the city of Yanga, and every August the 5th, they celebrate the presence of these Africans, Mexicans, who's been there all the time, okay? Amazing. And so this is why I'm in Old Town with the Mexican history, with the Spanish history, and you've always had African history that's been a part of it. And sure. so that's just goals. Uh, I'd like to talk to a couple of other uh, graphics. 
uh, before we go? Well, first of all, we have to get some of this African American history in because we deal with science. And this is just some of, I would say, a few of about 50 inventions we use every day invented by African Americans. We got the iron board. From the board. traffic light to the gas mask, the stethoscope, the straightening comb, the elevator, the golf tee. That's the one that gets me. 1899, an African American dentist by the name of Dr. George Grant invented the golf tee. Five months ago, we had Tiger Woods here. Walked away with the Torrey Pines Golf Championship trophy. Took him an extra day to do that. And the real watched it. But they didn't know that the golf tee that he teed off with was invented by an African American in 1899. And so these are the kind of things that we talk about and have. And it just deals with uh, some of the history and pictures that's just never been told and never talked about. And so this is just some of the things. But I'd like to get right close to home here in San Diego. African American pioneers in San Diego. The book is produced by the San Diego Historical Society. And you can't get much more of an authentic organization in Belleville Park than that. They produced the book and exhibit in 1982. We've been sharing the exhibit, the books, and history. And it just talks about all that history in San Diego. It talks about the founding of gold up in Julian by an African American, Fred Coleman. This is not Fred Coleman, but this is a sample of what Fred Coleman could have looked like finding pace of gold, flakes of gold, in a river that's now named after him up in Julian. And uh, he created the gold rush here in the San Diego area. And so Julian ended up uh, having quite an African American population. Uh, you have the famous Julian Hotel today that was built originally as the Hotel Robinson by two ex-slaves, Margaret and Albert Robinson. Um, the hotel is still there today, and Julian is very well known for his apple pies that Margaret Robinson used to bake to keep the travelers on the Butterfield stage line that stayed in her hotel healthy, okay? And so we talk about just a few of that. But out of this yellow book that you have another very important element that just came to uh, the surface about four months ago in La Jolla. I was privileged to unveil the first African American street sign in La Jolla. If you stand in front of the La Jolla post office, look to your left, you will see a street sign with Mabel Bell Lane on it. And that's a picture of me unveiling the paper because um, uh, as uh, uh, as well as they tried to organize it, uh, Scott Peters was a council member who was there with about 300 people in attendance. And when they pulled the string to remove the paper, the string broke. And I just happened to be Johnny on the spot with a folding chair. I stood at the base of the sign. And so here I am unveiling the history of the first African American street sign in La Jolla. And now we're working with a group in La Jolla, African-American group that goes back all the way past the 1920s to 1890, a presence of Africans in La Jolla. And we are going to be working on a walking tour of African-American property in La Jolla. So that's part of what the museum does uh, with the contemporary, with some of the students and things. But I want to try and share so that we don't lose it all. This is one very important element of the museum. Coins and stamps, one of many. Uh, we have a dozen exhibits that we uh, install in different places across the United States and halfway around the world. And these are just a few of the 139 African American stamps produced by the United States Post Office. You're seeing a coin in the middle of this first day cover of a legendary person in 1947 who integrated baseball, Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. But he's only one of eight different coins of African Americans on coins. So you're saying that African Americans have appeared on, on money? On money. 1946. 1946, Booker T. Washington on a 50 cents piece. 1951, Dr. George Washington Carver 
on a 50 cents piece. And both of those coins have over 90% silver. That was your silver content up until 1965. Uh, you have a coin that came out in 1998 with Crispus Attucks, the first person killed in the American Revolution. 1770, the Boston Massacre shot twice in the chest. And since 1998, we've had a silver dollar with him on it. These are all collector's items and coins and exhibits that we put on, uh, on, on sale, but we put on display in different facilities uh, around San Diego County and halfway around the world. And so this is just some of it, and I'm hoping that your camera is able to get this because this is awesome, and it goes on and on. But now I'd like to say that I believe it's, looks like it's Obama time. And here's a watch with our newly elected president on it. And it's just one of several items. As you see here, the coins and the stamps of President-elect Obama. You have totally about nine different coins with him on it. Uh, but you only have one stamp. The country of Liberia uh, has issued a stamp to honor him. It came out just shortly after he was elected. Uh, they developed over 600,000 of them, over half a million. And from what I understand, by now they have all sold out. I was fortunate enough to be here again, the early bird, to get a couple of them. And so we do have the coins as well as the stamp on on we're, display. We're coming down to our last five minutes, and I see this fascinating statue, and I see this okay. female buffalo soldier. We've okay. we got a couple of things we need to cover. we got five very minutes. Very good, here. very good. Just as we talk about 2,000 years of metallurgical science, and they put some of those African scientists in the slave ships, brought them over here to pick cotton, we can talk about this stone. This is one of four important stones, the sixth hardest rock in the world, green serpentine. It comes from the southern part. It comes from the southern part of Africa, uh, Zimbabwe. The second largest structure on the African continent is the Great Wall of Zimbabwe. 30 feet tall, a regular city block would fit inside of a complex, and these stones were as large as you and I. Okay. This is a small one, and you talk about some of those engineering and architectural skills 1,500 years ago, and they put some of those engineers and architects into slave ships, brought them over here to pick cotton, and didn't teach us anything about their engineering and architectural skills. Tell, mm -hmm. me, tell me about the rest of these things, these <laughs> paintings okay. you have here. He mentioned the female buffalo soldier. Uh -huh. Many of us know, since uh, General Colin Powell was a keynote speaker, that we released uh, several statues of the buffalo soldiers across the United States. Well, many people don't know about the female buffalo soldier. Her name was Kathy Williams. She had been a cook and a laundress for about three and a half years. Uh, during the Civil War, she learned so much about soldiering, she changed her name from Kathy Williams to William Kathy, and she joined the military as a man. Was in the military for 17 months before she took ill, doctors examined her, and kicked her butt out the military. So we have a graphic now honoring that f a little known female Buffalo soldier and a book. And so these are some of the graphics that we offer at the museum in the collection of the African American military. And all, and uh, mm -hmm. I, we have to get this in because mm -hmm. this is uh, Martin Luther King, all over. This is one of those street signs that used to be on Market Street here in San Diego. Every corner of Market Street in San Diego used to have a street sign that said Dr. Martin Luther King Wait. And our city, and I won't say it's wisdom, uh, voted it down. And so we now have Martin Luther King Promenade along the, uh, the waterfront near the convention center. We have a freeway that's called Martin Luther King Freeway, but you don't see this sign anymore, and it talks about some of the uh, question of wisdom about the city of San Diego. Okay, mm -hmm. now we, we got to move ahead. Okay. Tell me about this. Uh, this guy here is a Nubian guard. They were special forces hired by uh, the Islamic people in Saudi Arabia to guard the palaces. Uh, they're from Aswan, the lower part of, of uh, Egypt. And if you go to the four and five star hotels today in Saudi Arabia, you will see a doorman 
a remnants of this gentleman very much like the beef eater doorman from England that you see with the fancy outfit on. Mm -hmm. And so this is part of it. So I think with that, we've kind of covered most of what we have here. Yeah, we're going to have to close And I am right very now. pleased. I, I want to make sure that you get your most important <laughs> point out now, though. Most important point is that we're located in Old Town. With the first Europeans, you have the first Africans, and you have all of this history that's been there all the time. We're on the Internet. Just simply dial in. Uh, uh, we're one block behind Old Town Mexican Cafe, and not too many people don't know where the Old Town Mexican Cafe is, right down on San Diego, and we're right behind on Congress Street. And we've been a part of the Old Town community for almost a dozen years. And we're going to do a lot of Internet television projects coming up in the, in the near term, hopefully, uh, to get a lot of this information out for you. Very good. Uh, this is a lot to cover, and it's very fascinating. I mean, I can sit here and listen to you talk about these things forever and forever and forever. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time here, and I really appreciate you and your knowledge, you know, your, your, your seemingly encyclopedic knowledge of many of these things. Uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of so many scholars, and in order to be a professor, you have to be a student, and I say that I always say that I'm a better student than I am a professor. And that's a part of what we all have to do. And some of those students that we try to deal with have kept us uh, on our toes. And we have to be the student in order to be the professor to be the student again. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that a lot of our history has been covered up. And we really don't know who we are. And, and we have a lot of, of historical values that have not been expressed. I want to thank everybody that's come out. I want to thank you, Mr. Chuck Ambers, for, for your display. I wish we had more time here. Uh, again, we focus on positive people in the community. This is Walter Davis with Progress in San Diego. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And we can, you can, as you can tell, we have an extraordinary individual here that's been to visit us today. And we really appreciate you spending your time. Thank you very much.